Um, in one word, describe your experience at the Lynch. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's a funny question because one word's not, you know, one word sometimes is enough. Mm. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, one word. I don't want because there's so many words I can say. I can say great, which would be, <laughs> you know, I could say uh, exhilarating, I think is a good word. Inspiring. You know, when I guess when musicians are, are playing together, they, you know, I, I'm sure they can hear what's going on and see what's going on. And then, uh, sometimes it's just kind of, you know, they're just going through the repertoire. But occasionally they hit that sort of right feeling and they're all, you know, you can see it and you can hear it. You know, when I'm here and, it, and we hit that sort of special thing where we're all working as a group and you can really feel it and, and you can understand, you know, not necessarily because the language, we speak a language with our hands and, and what we make. And so and when we're all on the same page, that's, that's wonderful. I, I feel, uh, and it's another word, buzz, but you know, if I, it sounds a bit like sort of new speak, but um, yeah, I, there's, always a, there's always a buzz in the work, in the, when you walk into the workshop. You know? yeah. It's always, it's never a dull day. <laughs>meditation I guess when I was younger um, it's still the type of meditation um, it's a good way of losing you, you don't tend to think about anything else when you're making when I was like 11 when I first started but obviously I knew of clay beforehand and my I still have my first pot I, I which was made in 2001 and I was seven so but that was before I knew I was going to be a potter, which is nice to look back at something and see the child's uh, playfulness in my first pot and then seeing them now, which is quite nice. Well, I was doing actually something completely different. I was studying at university and I came to the point where I had the feeling that reading books, listening to talks and writing is not fulfilling for me. I wanted to do something with my hands. So I asked if I could do an apprenticeship. Uh, first, I asked for a work experience in a, in a local pottery and was accepted. And from the first, from the first day I was in there, I just, I just loved it. I was just bouncing and happy. <laughs> when they advertised the apprenticeship, <laughs> uh, to be honest, like, until that point, I never thought about being a potter. I said I studied as a furniture maker beforehand so I was doing woodwork and um, I said I'd done a couple of evening classes so I, I enjoyed pottery but as I was coming to the end of my degree I saw this advertised about the same time I was finishing and obviously being from St Ives knowing about this place and what, being a maker 
I just yeah I wanted to apply and then it's it's obviously since coming here I realise how much, how enjoyable it is to work with clay and I can't think of doing anything else really now but obviously until <laughs> until I got here I, I didn't uh, I didn't really think of it as a career path as such. Yeah. Um, well, I always loved clay, and I remember going to uh, like a craft centre near where I lived, where I actually did my work experience in the end, um, and I, I loved making pots there when I was little. And I, I kind of didn't really do anything with clay for quite a long time. I tried a bit at, at college, but we didn't have the facilities, and then I went to art school, and um, my first clay class was just hand building and I was so frustrated because I could see the wheels and I really wanted to get on them and I said to my lecturer like please can I have a go and he was like no there's too many of you there's too much work to do and then I went back at lunchtime and I made friends with this amazing woman called Bridget and she was a technician there and she let me get on the wheel and it was like instant love I've never felt anything like like I've wanted to do anything more um, I think I always kind of wanted to be a pot. I always, even you know, before I applied or knew that this this um, position was in existence, I knew I always had a love of pottery. I always collected mugs and wasn't really interested in tea bowls and just footed cups and craft in general. I think and. Um, you know, I think it was something people knew about me. So my mum told me about the apprenticeship here because she knew I was interested in pottery. I'd never done it. She just knew I really liked it. Um, I've always made stuff with my hands. I've always liked making stuff myself. So um, I guess I knew I wanted to be a potter when I applied for the apprenticeship. <laughs> um, when I knew it was possible to be a potter as a job. I. I don't think I I just I didn't know that you could do this as a job, like as in reality. So I guess then that that was the point at which I realised not only that you could do it, but that it was possible for me to do it. I guess um, it happened in stages for me, because I've I've always been creative. So when I had my first proper pottery lesson in year seven. I had my first lesson and I remember coming home and shouting pottery <laughs> to my mum just being so excited about it. I instantly fell in love but then I left that school and couldn't continue with it so um, when I went to university and studied fine art my course leader bought a wheel for the art block and um, once I had a go on that properly, I had had previous lessons, maybe like about ten, eight to ten hours worth of throwing lessons before. Um, and so towards the end of my degree, I just spent three months solid, like throwing on my own time um, as part of my degree. And I haven't looked back ever since. Oh, that's, well, that's a good question. It's going to have another long answer. <laughs> Originally, I wanted to be a filmmaker. So, but I had to get the right grades to get into film school and figuring I was not academically, you know, a, a shining star. So I thought, well, if I, um, I do an art course, because that would be easy. Um, I didn't know how hard it would be. I studied painting, I did printmaking, uh, a lot of the applied arts like weaving and... Uh, ceramics is, was just one of the things we did and at first I, I didn't really take to it I, I always because it was always sort of associated I've, in my mind with this sort of hobbyist thing and everybody makes kind of funny little things and it's kind of I didn't really want to want to do it and um, but I had to and so um, <coughs> I gradually uh, I think the, the thing the most the thing that got me into pottery was was uh, the firing the we did a rack of firing once and I, I really enjoyed that because I, I thought it was a little bit dangerous and a bit reckless and uh, the idea, you know, and I was seeing those pots red hot in the kiln and then being taken out and just dipped in sawdust and flames coming up and then I just really liked that. It was, and uh, and I think you know, that sort of started sparking an interest in me, you know, that, that uh, 
idea of the, the alchemy of it, you know, of like taking all these different materials that uh, and forming it into something useful or beautiful. You know, I got I just got gradually more interested, um, and uh, the challenge of it. And I think it's sort of for every. I mean, most artists, I think, they, they sort of you got to develop a kind of passion for something or an obsession, you know, and it's sort of just gradually gradually seeped in. And it's only maybe the last sort of seven years that I have completely given up wanting to be a painter. Um, I just, you know, now I, I, I understand the materials. I love, I love the materials and I feel like, you know, the things that I was going to express in painting, I can just about start to begin to express in working in clay. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of how I became a potter. Um, I started taking ceramics classes when I was in high school. Um, obviously, I grew up in the States, so I, I was really fortunate with the high school I went to. We had an excellent art program, and I, we would take intro to art, and then we were allowed to take ceramics or drawing or printmaking, or, you know, we had a lot of possibilities open to us. And I had the single most enthusiastic art teacher in high school, and she really got me fired up about it. So I, I started throwing when I was um, 15, 14, 15, and it just caught with me so um, when I when I finished high school I went on to do a, a degree in ceramics bachelor of fine arts degree at the Appalachian Center for Crafts and yeah I just carried on from there I never I never actually paused to think you know there was never that moment where I was like hmm, what do I want to do it just sort of happened it, it evolved quite naturally for me I think when I was when I was quite young I, I always would have got into either the arts or the sciences, those were kind of my interests, I'm, I'm very hands-on. Um, and ceramics is, is great because there's so much of both, you know, you can be as technical or not as you want with, when working with clay, there's, there's plenty of, um, you know, there's your glaze chemistry and firing theory and, and there's a lot of engineering if you feel like doing it, you know, so you, could, you can kind of take it as technical as you want. It's, it just really appeals to my nature. Um, well, when I was working on my, my degree back home, um, I took a semester to, out, and I, I did a semester study abroad in Australia, the Australia National University, which was, it was a great experience for me because it was, um, I think I'd gotten to a moment with my education where I, I couldn't remember if I was making pots because it was something I really enjoyed or if it was I was making them because I had grades and pressure and school and you know you, you forget you lose track you know mm -hmm. and I went to Australia and it, all those pressures were lifted and I was in the studio all the time making and I was meeting so many interesting people and one of the people I met while I was in Australia was um, Jack Doherty he's the former lead potter of the, the Leech Pottery and at the time this was this was back in 2007 so at the time they were they were just going through the renovations at the Leech and they were looking to reopen so they reopened in March of 2008, and I finished my degree in December and applied to come over. And it took about a year to get all my visas sorted, but I came late 2009. So. Um, because if you learn in one pottery, you might only learn the one skill set you have in that particular pottery. So traditionally, people would travel after they finish an apprenticeship to work with different potters and learn a different skill set uh, before they set up their own place. Well, I did what the old tradition of traveling, mm. although I didn't do it in the traditional way. So we have there, there's a journeyman tradition in Germany, which is quite strict. So I traveled freely. Um, and I worked in, uh, in New Zealand and France and Germany. And I wanted to work in, uh, in England as well. So I traveled through England and knocking at Potter's doors and asked if they would want me. And I just never thought I could ever possibly end up at the Leech Pottery. So I, but I, somebody, one potter, local potter, recommended that I maybe should uh, talk to somebody here that might need somebody. So I just thought, well, I'll try my luck. And I walked in, I just said, do you need somebody to work for you for a few months? And I said, yeah. I said, OK. <laughs> uh, I came here when I was younger and saw Warren McKenzie when he was here chatting to, to him and it, it, it just seemed like a very nice vibe um, and very like family 
feel all about the leech. I emailed a lot of potters and there wasn't really many people who would take on someone who's not had, or someone who's uh, not got any grades against my name. Um, and uh, I guess I'd be a bit of a, um, I, I was un unknown. So for anyone to give me a chance um, was quite difficult. I, I had a sort of, my coal man knew John Leach and we'd have a sort of conversation through the coal man and uh, I think it was just eventually uh, realised um, well I got given a chance with a trial week and um, it was quite nice that they saw the potential that I had. So when, I, when, when the opportunity first came up to apply for the job at the Leech Pottery, um, as at that time it was a senior production potter, so basically managing the studio and, and producing uh, standard wear range uh, as well as designing it. Um, yeah, I was, I was like, okay, I was in a, in a time of my life where I felt ready to take something on like that. Up until that point I'd be working um, down at the Jailyard Pottery, with, uh, um, which was founded by John Bedding, who was a former student of Leech. Um, and so uh, I felt, you know, I didn't, I, at first I didn't think, well, I'd have a chance because I'm not, I wasn't a, a, a well-known uh, potter in, in Britain. I just had, a, had my own gallery in town and I've been doing that for the best part of 15 years. And so, um, you know, I thought, well, I'm going to apply and see what, see what happens. And, uh, the next stage in, in growing my, my skill set was to come to, the, to, to Britain because, you know, this is the home, very much the home of Studio Pottery because of, of the leech. You know, I would, uh, you know, I would ever be involved here in the role that I am until the, the opportunity came and applied and was lucky enough to get the job. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it, I, I would be lying if I say that, that this wasn't one of the major events in my life to, to get this, this position and uh, I hope I have shouldered the responsibility well and, and uh, done, a, done a service to the tradition and hopefully it will continue to do so. Um, and I will always, e even if I no longer work here, I would, you know, this is, this is, this is very much uh, uh, part of who I am in, in some aspects. Yes. practice takes determination it takes um, hours and hours and hours of just sticking at it I think you've got to be quite disciplined um, and determined I think are two things with uh, pottery because you get a lot of failures and I think yeah I would say mostly determination and patience to to push through it I, I've got to say that I was abysmal when I started out and I think Kind of most people tend to be. It's not. It's not the kind of thing that you can just sit down and start doing. Um, but it is a very fair skill in that anybody can learn to be a potter. To have ambition and uh, a good memory to remember exactly why you decided to do this at times, because there are times where where it's hard. Um, but yeah, it's all very rewarding. Obviously, it's not a it's not a nine to five job. It's uh, it's a lifestyle. It's if you have to love clay. Was what my master was saying. If you want to become a potter, you have to love clay, and you have to you have to love it more than an ordinary job because you spend you spend your weekends, you spend your evenings. Your family has to go along with that as well, so they have to accept your passion as a potter. Heart, determination, and. Patience. Be, well, I don't think you're ever going to make a perfect pot because your idea of a perfect pot will never, you'll never be able to make it. You can make things 
like it, but you're never going to be able to do exactly what you want. It, you need an ability to to soldier through. Mm. I think you get, it's very much ups and downs. So one day you think you've got it, and then the next day you haven't. And it's very much peaks and plateaus, peaks and plateaus. Um, you have to be ready for every situation to be a potter. I'm I'm pretty lucky because I'm working for the leech. You know, to somebody who's thinking that it would be nice to be a potter, the, that skill is totally in their grasp. They just have to be determined enough to reach out and grab it and keep practicing until they get it right. Imagination, because you're starting off with a very blank page with a lump of clay and you have to use your imagination to try and think about what you can do with that. Yeah, your heart has to be in it, otherwise I think it won't work. You need that as well to be a potter, I think. You need that sort of drive to want to keep learning and keep progressing. Um. The leech pottery is important to me personally because I think we work in a, a similar way and I don't think I would have been able to learn as quickly as I have or being able to progress my personal work as well um, if I was anywhere else but here. So as a creative person and a production potter, I think, yeah, this is definitely the best place for me. Um, I think you want to think about the, the leech as the top of a family tree of studio potters, is the way I see it. So there are so many people that have been trained here in the past that have then gone all around the world and set up potteries and trained other young potters and and that's what that's what this place embodies that's what this place is about it's about ensuring that the next generation of potters have a good start in the world and you know when we finish our work here whoever you know when I finish working at the leech I'll go on and I'll have my own studio and hopefully I'll train up some people and then and then that knowledge carries on the importance of the leech is just to bring back the simplicity of like form and things that aren't overcomplicated because you overcomplicate something it adds extra steps and it's just looking at something and seeing it as a useful daily day item but also as a beautiful piece as well. Um, I think why the leech is still so special is that it's not, it's, it's obviously a business, but it's also a learning facility for um, new apprentices and it's, it's very orientated with teaching uh, the way of a potter, I guess, a way of being a craftsman. The workshop's made up. Um, of people from um, America, Germany, Africa, as like is, and we get people from all over the place come along, um, wanting to work here. And it's 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 nice to be international and welcome everyone. Um, well, I mean, what he did for pottery, uh, you know, for ceramics, especially modern day, you know, he changed the sort of Western view on pottery, you know, before it was like, it was a very much just a, almost like a, but it wasn't really seen as an art form, it was more just, it was a job, you made stuff for use, and that's still what we do, but it's now seen as more of a, yeah, more of an art form and more creative, so... On that front, he changed ceramics in the Western world completely. You know, I don't think we'd have any of this sort of more. Well, it's recognised as an art form today. You know, almost a hundred years on, it's very much seen in you know same in the same areas, fine art and all of that. But before he sort of brought that mentality, it wasn't. So he's made a huge impact even now. And but also the people that trained here and then went on to train other people elsewhere and spread, you know, so he had a very global impact because of the amount of people that come through. 
and I think like that's something that we're sort of trying to redo today almost you know with the volunteer program and with us tr apprentices training with the aim of that we'll probably leave at some point and maybe train other people and so it's very much in that same same style of working it seems now so I feel to me that's the important part is sort of continuing that and trying to keep a keep a craft going that might not ne necessarily stay alive as such if it wasn't for places like this really so yeah I think that's that's how what it means to me yeah, yeah. When Bernard died, I was I, I then I was probably only seven years old, so I never met him or or knew much about him. But his influence was um, significant throughout the the ceramics world and and uh, all the way all around the world. And and uh, where I come from, uh, I had, I had um, met potters who worked in that tradition. And it wasn't, it wasn't just the work that they produced, but it was also the, the kind of attitude they have towards life and towards work. And so for me, it was just, it was just a kind of, uh, the way of working, there's, you know, the, a sort of easy way of working, uh, making beautiful things that other people use. And also, you know, enjoying it while you're doing, while you're making it, uh, but as well as have a sort of respect for the people using them, using these things you make. It's very, it's a very difficult. There's so many factors, you know, from, from uh, just the aesthetic side of it, the artistic side of it, but then there's also an immense n uh, knowledge base that you have to acquire to make something even very simple look good, and that's and I, and I, I, I sort of relish that challenge. I think and uh, being able to work in that tradition, I feel, and and especially here. Uh, it's an immense honour. Well, obviously what Bernard Leach did and Hamada was a massive, poignant part of the craft movement. And having this here to physically see makes it really real to people. Um, and I think that's really important that we remember how it is that we got to this stage in craft and in the way that we see handmade things. As a craftsperson, I think he has made he's made such a difference to like I said the way that we see crafts and the way that we see handmade things and I think we owe him a lot in the sense that we now respect the handmade and the skilled and for me that's really important because that's what I do and if people didn't understand how special it is to have something handmade over something machine made then then I don't really know what I'd be doing right now these pots have got a lot of soul and and we let we're not everything is is well made really well made but also it's not um, made with crazy restrictions about like the slightest curve in in a rim that kind of thing we actually pride ourselves in because we're not we're trying to let each pot speak for itself and we're trying to keep the soul in what we do. We're not, we're not machines, and that's why we're doing what we're doing, because we aren't machines. So then compared to um, <laughs> factory-made yeah. pots, compared to those, does the leech stand out? Um, yes, because every, every single pot has a slight difference. Each one has a, its own personality. So you won't get that in a factory-made pot, really. No. It's all a matter of opinion, isn't it? Really, you know, I don't. I wouldn't say. I mean, they're different uh, manufactured pots in the sense that you can very much see the human hand has been involved in the making. You know, with that more natural kind of look. Um, well, with manufactured, it's all very uniform, isn't it? And it's it's very, um, in my opinion, sterile. And like, I don't like the thought of the fact that I can say walk into a coffee shop in London and order a mug of whatever and get it in a cup and then I could go Japan or Australia or South America and I'd go into a coffee shop and order it and get the same mug. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's no life in that to me. Uh, for me, since making handmade pots anyway, I never really thought about this before, but it adds to the experience, you know, so they're quite 
everyday almost mundane experiences having a cup of tea and having your breakfast and this and but when you've got a selection of handmade different pots from different people different it's like you know you're making a choice every time you go and eat or drink you sort of think oh I'm going to use this one because of this 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 you know I, I don't want to say that like factory made pots are bad or they're evil I think even in his book you know Bernard Leach said that these factories have the capacity to make a lot of work very quickly they have the capacity to be very efficient and we make with individual attention and care and each pot is is made by a person and that connection never leaves when somebody uses like a mug that's handmade versus a mug that's been made in a factory that that connection to the handmade it it never goes you know you you always have that connection to the maker when you're using that mug an ikea mug is great if you just want a vessel to contain your coffee and drink it Um, but we live in a world where everything becomes so anonymous and plain and empty without soul and if you buy a pot made here you're not only buying a pot which will contain your coffee or your tea or your porridge or whatever. You buy something which has been touched by a human being and by using those vessels which have been made by a human hand and visibly made by a human hand, you more or less make a connection with that person who made the pot. So there is quite an, there's an intimacy between maker and the person who is using it later without then they knowing each other but they touch each other through that pot in a way and we're connecting and it makes I think it makes life less anonymous and less and it just brings more soul into life and Leach puts emphasize the handmade um, so they're all a little bit wonky but in a really nice way since I started using handmade pottery every day um, I know that I never want to go back to using uh, bought machine-made pottery but yeah behind every pot there's always going to be a story of how that pot's been made and who made it and how they got to that point in their development and yeah I well the factory made stuff um well still a mug still use it and if you're judging the pots on um use then they're quite capable of doing the same job as these but it's also just keeping ev- like everything l- local so the clays from uh, Dables which is 20 miles away so you get the sense of the surroundings within the um, pot as well as the vibe of the workshop it's with a mass produced pot you um, you don't know the maker if there is a maker there's probably a machine doing it um, and it's a knowledge that if there is a maker the person's not going to be enjoying their work because it's not about um, quality it's about quantity in their line of work so uh, the the differences are that they don't really care about the piece. They 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 would count the pots before they're even made. Handmade pots are definitely more special than factory made pots. They they've got personality. They like I said before that although they're all the same, there are slight differences. You know, we've got six people making the same thing, so handles although the same are going to be slightly different even if we were making them exactly the same just because of the size of people's fingers and hands and um, what the clay's like on any given day. Um, they're, they're things you can learn to love and you grow to love. Um, every day, you know, if you're drinking tea or coffee out of your leech mug every morning or any handmade mug, there's things you'll notice every day, imperfections, little slight discolorations, you know, they're handmade, so there's no precision in a sense. There's, you know, as much precision as handmade can make. So, you know, they have an impact on you, which factory or 
mass produced wares don't they're all exactly the same you buy two mugs from Tesco they're going to be exactly the same and you know there's nothing else you can learn about it once you've seen it Does pottery, or the leech pottery, uh, do you think it has a long future ahead of it? Yeah, I do, I really do, because um, if anything, I think we've, we've actually started to appreciate handmade more now than we have in like, the past. Yeah, of course, I mean, it's already had a long future. It's something that's it's not going to go away. Um, whether it's popular or not will change. It's, um, it's all part of trends, but it's always going to exist because there are always going to be people who need to express themselves through through clay, through anything. It's it's craft. Craft can't you can't kill craft. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think um, handmade handicrafts. It's almost like part of this. Um, I feel there's almost like a counter culture movement currently and all the you know there's all these things and I believe that there seems like this, there's a movement away from the mass manufactured. I think it does because uh, what I mentioned previously um, our world gets more and more anonymous and things are exchangeable you buy things they break throw them away buy them new and I think there is a counter movement to that there is a there, there are people who now appreciate slow cooking, they appreciate gardening, they, and they will appreciate as well a handmade pot over a clinical shop board pot. Oh absolutely, I mean this, this place will carry on because people love, love it and care about it, you know. I don't, I don't think anybody would be willing to see it go without a fight. I think there will be a sort of, a kind of need for handmade things. Um, because we're in such a, a technological, uh, mass-produced world now that I think soon people <laughs> they might start to look at uh, our pots and realise actually it's really nice. Um, yeah, uh, well it's been going, it's coming up to a hundred anyway, it's, um, it's been going this long. Um, and I think once it, well, it's got history behind it, and once the history is set, then um, it's very hard to adjust it. You, the things will come back. There's so many people that's come through this place that um, even if it turns to a story, it will still be quite a magical story. So. Um. Well, I, I certainly hope so. I mean, it's a very fragile thing. I think um, a lot uh, has been lost over the last few decades. This, this, this been, and again, this is going to be political. This, this sort of neoliberal idea that every problem can be solved by throwing money at it, and it's and private money, and everything has to make profit for somebody that's investing in it. Um, whereby the quality of education, especially in the arts, and, uh, and uh, has suffered in the last few decades. Um, you just look at, the, at what great art schools and opportunities and, and the ceramics courses that was on offer in Britain even two decades ago compared to now. Um, it's horrendous. It's, it's, a, it's a real indictment on how our society has got to this point where that's no longer that we don't see that as you know, important anymore, even though Britain has such a fantastic history in, in, in creativity. I mean, so much of what the world has today has, you know, has, has come from the, the Enlightenment tradition of this island. Um, I think it's the engine of civilization. It's really, you know, and so, and I, mean, I know what we do is a very small part in things, um, and, but I think it's precious and we have to preserve it. Whether, it, whether we will, you know, that's another question. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to train a next generation of, of people that would carry that torch. Hopefully we'll carry on far into the future, perhaps, you know, you know another hundred years we'll, we'll still be here. Uh, I won't, but, um, 
yeah, I, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, but uh, I do feel uh, that the, 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 the fragility of what we do um, is very apparent to me um, as well. And it's, you know, it's, it's uh, something that weighs heavy on my mind. Um, but you know, all I can do in my role is, is to make a way for the next one. And I think that's, you know, that's also powerful, you know, what, as a civilization we should do. We should be the best of, you know, we should be the sum of all the best characters of being human. It's very important.